running game is it the running backs or is it the offensive line i think it's probably a combination of both i mean you're not seeing the line generate the push that you want to see and i think you know some of that is just it is is inexperience and some of that frankly is cohesion because in a zone blocking based scheme like the one the broncos are using you've got to know what your neighbor's doing as much as what you're doing you know there's a lot of stuff that involves working working in tandem with each other that's where the Broncos are struggling up front. And then at running back, I mean, C.J. Anderson isn't healthy. He's had the toe injury since uh, uh, late in week one. He had, and he's also been listed on the injury report with an ankle problem. Of course, he had an ankle injury last year as well. So he hasn't, he hasn't been healthy. I think the toe has really hampered him because, you know, as far as, like, getting that explosion when he gets the ball, I don't think it's in there. And then, you know, Ronnie Hillman, you know, he had a good preseason, but we've seen over the last two regular seasons that, that, that there's limitations to, to what he can do. You, know, you look at that third down run in the, uh, in the fourth quarter, and he has an opportunity to, or to actually a pass from Peyton to Manning, excuse me, and he has a chance to get upfield and get, the, get a little bit more yardage for the first down. Say he, he goes to the sideline and gets knocked out of bounds. Now it might have been a bad spot, but still, you want him turning upfield a little bit. So I think it's a, it's, the running game struggles, it's on the entire scheme, the line and the running backs, not just one or the other. Uh, you know, you were sitting right by me uh, on Sunday night. The offensive line is looking better. I don't know that mm-hmm. it could look any worse. But C.J. Anderson's been hurt all through college, and except for a stretch of about seven or eight games last year, he's been hurt all the time. So I don't know if that's going to be just commonplace like it was with Noshaw Marino. Uh, Ronnie Hillman, I remember John Fox telling me, uh, a couple of, a couple of years ago, oh, Ronnie Hellman looks great in training camp. He's looked great in every training camp. He's a guy you'd take to malls and say, this guy's a running back. Let him run around in the mall around cars, and then he gets in the regular season, and, he, and he's really not doing much. They're not even they're, they're not even catching passes out of the backfield. Uh, Manning's not trustful of them. Uh, Thompson comes in and has a nice little burst there for about four or five yards, and he gets hurt on the the play at the goal line, and they have Ronnie Hellman. Ronnie Hillman's your guy that on on a key play at the goal line you give the ball to. Why can't why can't we see Bibbs? Why can't we see him? I mean, is he that bad that he just belongs on the practice squad? He's just a guy, a jag. Well, I think uh, when you're part of that was roster construction because of course they let go of Monte Ball, who would have been the fourth running back, but they were. You did that because you did that because you figured out that Bibbs could provide comfortable quality, but you could sneak in through the practice squad because the bottom line is almost every team has a young running back that they like and they they stash on the practice squad. That's why it's actually kind of easy to slip those guys through uh, once once you once you get rid of them. So I, I don't think it's that Capri Bibbs can't play. I think it's a little bit of a roster calculus situation that put him on the practice squad, but. You know, if Anderson's not healthy, if, if you know Juwan Johnson, he's got the neck problem, that the neck injury he suffered Sunday. If they can't go, I think, well, I think certainly that that Bibbs will actually get his shot this week at this week at some point, and you know, we'll see what he can do. I mean, I don't think that he could uh, he that he could do uh, much worse than, than what the Broncos have gotten out of the running game so far. He's healthy, he's fresh, he hasn't taken any hits. It may be time to to give him an opportunity if uh, the injuries dictate the Broncos are going to are going to move some somebody up. But, but then comes the question of who you move off the pitch three man roster to make room. That's another discussion point entirely. Yeah, Andrew, it just hit me why why Peyton Manning is bothered. He's why he's annoyed by the media lately. We we do harp on the negative. We are talking about a team that's three and zero. And and if you listen to this conversation. You might think they were 0 3. Well, but we're harping on a team that is last in per yards in running Got it. and is uh, 20, 31st, I think, in, in total yards. I'm going to give you guys some names, and I want you to tell me if any of these guys does anything for you that would be worthy of it. Ahmad Bradshaw, Ray Rice, Felix Jones, Pierre Thomas. No, Sean Marino said he's not going to play this year, but he was effective his last year here. Do any of those four guys do anything at all for you that you would say, well, it'd be worthy of them to bring them in for a workout? Well, 
if you're looking for an every down back, I'm not sure any of those guys fit the bill because we're talking about injury concerns with some of those guys, and you know Pierre Thomas being more of a of a change of pace back. I mean, I'm, you know, that's that you know that, that's that's what the deck shuffles up at this point, and uh, you know, it's actually kind of telling that no one. That that being said, it's kind of telling that no one's uh, really picked up a Monte Ball at yeah. this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if they were going to bring anybody in, it would be a guy who knows the playbook already. He they said, spent a second-round draft pick. Yeah, on. he put out on his Twitter account or whatever, I'm going to sign with the Indianapolis Colts. And uh, I haven't seen that happen yet. So Team, Yeah, teams generally don't like it when you put the, the presumptive tweet out before you join them. That's, that, I'm sure that didn't sit very well. Andrew, let's talk about this defense. Uh, you know, the, the thing that, I, uh, that impresses me so much is that it's not just one or two or three guys who are making these plays. It's everybody. And it's not just starters. It's reserves as well. I mean, this last game, uh, Shaquille Barrett, uh, Roby, um, uh, David Bruton Jr. They're getting it from everybody. Have we not given John Elway enough credit for building this defense? Uh, pro- probably not. I mean, now obviously he inherited Bruton. That was, he was a, you know, you could, if, if, if not the best, best pick overall, certainly the best value pick of the Josh McDaniels era was David Bruton going from a, a, the, the middle rounds to being a, a contributor and a, and a special teams captain like he is. But, yeah, you think about what they've, what they've found in the undrafted ranks. I mean, Shaq Barrett was an undrafted guy. We know all about Chris Harris Jr. You know, look at, look at, the, look at the inside linebackers. Dane Grayson and Brandon Marshall both playing well. One was a sixth rounder. One was a crack was a Guy signed to the practice squad after the Jaguars uh, let him go. I mean, they, they they really know what they're looking for. So, but that being said, I think the coaching has brought out the best in a lot of these guys. I think the, I think this scheme, Wade Phillips is three four. It's a much better fit for the skill sets of the players on that side of the line of scrimmage than uh, what Jack Del Rio was doing. And then you look at the position coaching, and the the guy I think has really made an impact is Bill Kolar because. He's in particular affected one guy, Sylvester Williams at nose tackle, and Williams doesn't look like anything that he did the first two years. I mean, he he looks like a first round pick, whereas you know his performance was scatter shot at best, to the point where he wasn't even starting by the end of last season, and now he looks like a first rounder. The way he's getting a, pu- a push off the snap, the way he's getting in the back, the way he's disrupted, and the, and he and the other guys up front, they're setting the guys up on the back end. To, to make it, to get the takeaways, get the interceptions, to recover the force fumbles. You know, it's just a matter of whether they can keep uh, getting their hands on them and securing them where they have in the last three games. But it's a, it, it, it is a brilliantly constructed defense as far as how the strengths of the guys in the front seven and the secondary mesh with mesh with each other very well. Yeah. Well, we we forgive me. We all know that. And here I am carping, but this is a three O team that could have been zero three. Actually, we haven't heard a drop from Shane Ray. Uh, I wonder what happened to him and Kilgore Trout or whoever that backup. Darius you talked about, Kilgo. well, whatever it is, <laughs> Kilgore Trout, I like better uh, in the Kurt Vonnegut novels. Uh, what's the story on those two guys? I, I haven't heard their names mentioned once. Well, Kilgore's rotated in a little bit, but the thing, the thing is when the Broncos play in their nickel and dime sub packages, they're going to generally use two defensive linemen and then four linebackers in part because – they want to have Brandon Marshall and Dane Trevathan on the field. So that would leave your two down linemen. You, and if you're trying to get a pass rush, you'd want Malik Jackson and Antonio Smith as the guys there. And sometimes Sylvester wins because he has some pass rush, rush heels coming out of North Carolina. So I think that's part of the reason why you haven't seen a lot of Darius Kilgo. Shane Ray, you know, we heard, you know, unfortunately heard his name for the wrong reasons in the Kansas City game when he got at got caught out of position, missed a tackle on Jamal Charles, and he took off and had 34 yards score. That just shows you the part of his game that really needs work. I mean, you, you know he can get to the edge in the, pa- in the pass rush. You know he can get around an offensive tackle. But sometimes he's out of position against the run. Sometimes he's, uh, you know, so, sometimes because he's focused on getting outside the tackle, he needs to do, do a little bit more of getting to the inside. So I think he's just, hit with, with Shane Ray, it's just a case of, He's got to learn a few more moves. This is, it happens to pass rushers a lot of time when they come to this level that they, uh, you know, they, they realize that what worked in college and what even worked in the preseason isn't going to work in the NFL. Shaq Barrett, you know, he's he was on the practice squad last year. He had a cup of coffee on the 53-man roster, even though he didn't get out there. So he had 
that day to day experience of going up against an, a, you know, an opposing offensive line in practice. And you know, I think he's a little bit ahead, and I think that's why you're seeing him uh, play the way he is. And also, to his credit, he worked like a demon in the off season. Like he was out at how he's in the weight room pretty much every day, really reshaping his body. You know, it's a credit to him what he's done. I think Shane Ray, I think he'll get caught up. It's just going to take him a little bit of time. It's very typical for a rookie. And then look, Bradley Roby yeah. had some struggles as a, as a rookie last year as well. And look uh, look how he's doing right now. Yeah, well, Shane, Shane should shut up about being defensive rookie of the year if he can't get on yeah. the field. Uh, I, I would ask both of you again. There, there seems to be a team in the league that's having a garage sale. Uh, would you go? You seem concerned uh, all the time less about the offensive line. Would you go to the Chicago John Bears? Fox and say, hey, we're going to give you a fourth-round draft choice. Uh, give us one of those offensive linemen. Or uh, Matt Forte, would you trade a couple of players on that defense that you guys are talking He's about? He's the only player they got, Matt Forte. Well, I don't think they'll uh, I, I read today He's... that Matt Forte may be the next to go. Would you go after Matt Forte? a good question. I mean, he's... I'd listen. He, I, I think at this, I mean, I hate to go into John Fox speak, but I think he would always say that you consider everything. And, I, you know, if you're looking at a team that's clearly dismantling and, and building for the future, maybe you can get the value. The, the question would be uh, salary cap ramifications on in, on anyone you bring in. But uh, if Chicago is in selling mode, I think uh, everyone who's a contender may inquire and, 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 and sniff around and see what's there. And you know, look what Carolina did yesterday. Look what New England did yesterday. And actually, for Carolina, I love the Jared Allen pick up for them because Charles Johnson hurting, and you know they fancy themselves a contender, and they should back to back division title, three and zero start. And so, I'd be surprised if the Broncos didn't at least investigate the possibilities coming out of Chicago. Hey, Andrew, playing in the pistol so much on Sunday night against Detroit was that dictated by game circumstance, or is this the offense we're going to see from here on out? Well, the, the Broncos saw something from the Lions on film. They saw that other teams had used the pistol with some effectiveness against Detroit. So some of that was game plan and, and scheming, but certainly it had a very it had a very nice impact on the on the passing game. Peyton Manning went back to having Peyton Manning like numbers, you know, a, a rating of north of a hundred, two touchdowns, one interception, was on a tip trail, over three hundred yards. So you got that part of the offense back back on track. Whether it get whether the pistol gets the running game going, I, I'm not sure. I think that's going to depend more on the block on, on the guys up front and also what the running backs do. I, I think the impact may be negligible, but the fact that Peyton Manning, you know, is able to get get the snap five yards back and you know see what he's not dropping back and see what's coming, I think I think that helped him. He looked much more settled, much more comfortable. And if you work it right, you can do a lot of the same things that you want to do in the running game out of the pistol that you can. Uh, out of a, a, an under center set, set up. So I, I think we may see more of it going forward. Maybe not as much as we saw Sunday, but I think it's going to be a part of the Broncos attack. Should be. Uh, the Packers ran it very su- successfully last night again against the mm-hmm. Chiefs. Uh, Aaron Rodgers was in the pistol. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly when you play Kansas City again, I think I'd run it based on what I saw last night, and I'd certainly run it against the Vikings because they, no, they got no pass rush. It's interesting that Kansas City has so much uh, has so many struggles against the pistol. And obviously, it's the quality of the opponent. But you know, they see, you know, they actually had Chris Alt, the uh, the godfather of pistol offense, and as a consultant a, yeah. a couple of years ago for Alex for when when Alex Smith first got there. So the fact that the Chiefs did so poorly against it looked, seemed very ill prepared was surprising to me. Hey, Andrew, we want to get you in studio here on uh, on Tuesdays. You up for that? I, I yeah, I, I will be up there. A little bit of a snap food today, but uh, it's all right. Yeah, I'm going to plan my Tuesdays around joining you guys downtown. All right, beautiful. Uh, Andrew. Planning around going to the zoo or something. (laughs) i I, got to ask you guys, so would you consider bringing in Alex Gibbs? Uh, Gary Kubiak worked with Alex Gibbs for years. He's he's sitting in his garden in Phoenix. Do you think it's a coaching thing? Because Rick Dennison knows how to coach zone blocking, or do you think it's a a player talent thing? I haven't seen it. Rick Dennison learned under Alex Gibbs, so you would assume he would, but Alex Gibbs is still the master of zone blocking, and he's just sitting there and taking care of his garden in Scottsdale. I think it's more a talent thing, frankly. Andrew, what do you think? I think it's it's talent and experience. I mean, and and getting everyone on the same page, like, you look at Sunday night, Evan Mathis, I thought, had by far the best game he's had since coming here. Now, some of that may have been you know, emphasizing the pass more and the pistol, but I think also he's really starting to, 
to, to get accustomed and get comfortable with the, with the guys around. So yeah, I I, that, yeah, you that know, was, that we, was a huge step. I think we're. I think everybody's just being too impatient. I mean, they have only played three games together. Well, I'm, These in, things I'm take impatient. Time. Uh, forgive mm-hmm. me, Andrew, but you said inexperienced. They got three guys that have been in the Pro Bowl or been top quality. Uh, Offensive lineman in the league, and I'm not seeing them overpowering anybody. Harris played a better game, uh, but I haven't heard much at all. I mean, yes, uh, Mathis played better, but my God, those three guys have got to got to do a better job. Yeah, it, it, it's experience, but it's not experience together. That's and, and that's the thing when you look at, at this scheme, and usually it takes offensive, an, an offensive line group working together for about a year to really get the hang of it. And you also look at how... We don't many, have a year. Oh, we I don't know, have a year. That's the thing. That's I'm day-to-day. Day. I don't have a year. I'm, I'm allowed to be impatient. I want to see it sometime <laughs> in my lifetime, which could end quickly. Yeah, I mean, and, and even like with the young guys, I mean, you, know, you look at when they develop guys like Chris Myers and George Foster... You know, and uh, you know Cooper Carlisle, and, and, you know Ben Hamilton, Tom, you know Tom Nail, and a lot of the guys that they brought through, they usually sat for a year and watched, uh, and, and watched this scheme work. And you know now you have Sam Brillo out there as a rookie, and Matt Paradis, even though he was here at, on the practice squad, you know his his real first real exposure is no blocking. He's out there right away. So I think I think by the back half of the season they're going to get the hang of it. Uh, oh. I, I, I I honestly wonder, Woody and Les. I honestly wonder if they were kind of thinking, okay, we just want to see them grow and develop, and the hope is that they they be at something close to full speed and full effectiveness by the time you get to November one, well, that's when risky. the schedule starts against Green Bay. That's yeah, risky, Andrew. That's why you're talking about impatience. Risky. You know, you brought up a name, and forgive me, because less of goodbye, but uh, this this is important, I think. Chris Myers is sitting there. He announced his retirement because nobody really wanted him. You met, you brought up Chris Myers. Chris Myers played center for Gary Kubiak. Why not bring him in? And then you've got if you're going to wait till November, you could bring in Chris Myers right now. Stick him in there. Take the backup for Ince and take him and put him on the practice squad or something, or get rid of him. And put it. Then you'd have four guys that actually have been around this league and played extremely well. And right, you've got a left tackle that that is inexperienced. But the more the merry in terms of experience. I, I just you're saying the one thing they have going for them is they got a kind of a dog schedule for the next four or five weeks, so they can maybe get through and beat teams like they did in Detroit. But uh, I, it concerns me. The offensive line concerns me. Yeah, I, I and I I don't blame I don't blame you. I can I can't blame any fan as well for being concerned. About, about the line. I mean, as, I'm as, as the best. old coach, as, as the coach who was here the last few years, always say it is what it is. And right or, now, you look, you, it, 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 has, it has struggled. John Elway so, seems concerned. I, he said, I don't know about the rest of you, but these victories are taking it out of me. He said that on Facebook <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, appreciate your time. We'll see you next Tuesday, okay? No problem, gentlemen. Take all right, care. That's Andrew Mason of DenverBroncos.com, and all of our guests are brought to you by Papa John's, better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's.